Hello, I'm Dr. Bridget Nash, and I'd like to welcome you to The Therapy Show, a podcast series that seeks to demystify mental health treatment. Today, I'm honored to welcome Dr. Frederick Reamer, a professor in the School of Social Work at Rhode Island College for over 30 years. Dr. Reamer received his PhD from the University of Chicago and has served as a social worker in correctional and mental health settings. He chaired the National Task Force that wrote the National Association of Social Workers Code of Ethics, adopted in 1996, and recently participated in drafting new technology standards added to the code in 2017. Dr. Reamer lectures both nationally and internationally on the subjects of professional ethics and professional malpractice and liability. He has conducted extensive research on professional ethics and has been involved in several national research projects sponsored by the Hastings Center, Carnegie Corporation, Haas Foundation, and Center for Bioethics at the University of of Pennsylvania. Dr. Reamer is the author of many books, including Risk Management and Social Work, Preventing Professional Malpractice, Liability, and Disciplinary Action, Boundary Issues and Dual Relationships in the Human Services, The Social Work Ethics Audit, a Risk Management Tool, and his latest, On the Parole Board, Reflections on Crime, Punishment, Redemption, and Justice. Dr. Reamer, welcome to The Therapy Show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Can you start by telling us a little bit about your personal background and professional development that led to your research in the ethical use of technology in social work practice? Sure. Well, I got into the social work profession many years ago, primarily to work in prisons, which I ended up doing for many years, 27 to be exact. In addition to my academic work, I've always spent time working in the field, primarily in prisons. And Early in my career, when I was working in prisons, I encountered a number of very challenging ethical issues in my work with inmates, issues related to confidentiality limits and informed consent and conflicts of interest, things like that, and discovered early on that I didn't have much knowledge about professional ethics and was so intrigued by these issues that I began to explore those issues And that ended up becoming a major focus of my career. For many, many years, my focus related to professional ethics and social work ethics was primarily on challenging ethical issues, what we call ethical dilemmas, conflicts among social workers' duties and obligations. And I wrote quite a bit about ethical decision making and uh, over time risk management, how to protect clients, but also how to prevent lawsuits and uh, licensing board complaints. And about, oh, I would say eight or nine years ago, I began to encounter a number of novel ethical challenges related to practitioners' use of technology. No great surprise, these issues did not exist earlier in my career. There was no Google, there was no Facebook, no Snapchat, no Twitter, no LinkedIn, none of that. And as this technology has emerged, and as practitioners and clients have increased their use of technology, I've encountered an increasing number of ethical issues, which led me to begin thinking about those issues, writing about those issues, and as you said in your intro, working with the National Association of Social Workers, the Association of Social Work Boards, the Council on Social Work Education, and the Clinical Social Work Association to develop ethical and practice standards so that social workers are using this technology responsibly. And social workers do a lot of the therapy in the United States, is that correct? That's correct, yes. In recent years, there's been a dramatic increase in social workers' use of technology to do several things. One is, as you just mentioned, to deliver services. Many social workers who are now using technology to deliver services never received any training during their formal education. For many, the technology didn't exist. So people are, if you will, building a boat in the middle of a rushing stream using this technology, such as video counseling and text message counseling and online social networking communication with clients and using apps on smartphones to communicate with clients. Many social workers are using the technology to deliver services, but in my experience, have not had a great deal of training in the use of it on the technical side and often are not familiar with emerging ethical standards. In addition to 
using technology to deliver services to clients, some of whom social workers will never meet in person. Now, I know that many social workers are using technology to supplement their office-based work with clients. They're using it to sustain contact with clients in between sessions, to supplement the in-person work they're doing with clients. I've encountered quite a few social workers who are using this technology to deliver services to clients they will never meet in person, and that raises some very unique ethical issues. In addition to delivering services using technology, social workers are also using technology to communicate with clients. In other words, not for the clinical intervention itself, but to maintain contact with clients using text messaging or what most of the world calls SMS, which stands for short message service. In the United States, we use the phrase text messaging. When I travel around the world, and I've had the opportunity to do that, most social workers don't know what I mean when I say text messaging. I use the phrase SMS. They're also using email. They're using online social networking, private messaging to communicate with clients, uh, email. And I've been involved in a number of licensing board cases in recent years, where licensing boards had some concern about the ways in which social workers were using technology, again, not just to deliver services, but to communicate with clients. And then in addition, many social workers are using technology to search for information about clients online, to manage and store very sensitive uh, confidential information uh, on EMRs and EHRs, electronic medical records, electronic health records. And here, too, I've encountered some very novel, unprecedented ethical issues that I can explore with you later if you'd like. Absolutely. Do you think technology is transforming social work practice? I not only think so, I, I know so. And I say that with some humility, but I say I know it because I'm encountering uh, very directly the ways in which technology has altered the social work landscape. It has fundamentally changed the profession, and I would say in several ways. First, I, we have to think very differently about the question, what do we mean by relationship? And of course, Most social workers received their training at a time when it was a given that the relationship between social worker and client would occur in an office with a door closed, sometimes home-based services, but there was face-to-face contact. Well, now we have to ask the question, what does it mean to have a relationship with a client who is in a remote location and possibly a client we will never meet in person? That's question number one. Question number two, what do we mean by privacy? Now, this is not a new concept. Of course, social workers have always been concerned about privacy and confidentiality ever since the inauguration of the profession in the late 19th century. But with the advent of technology, we now have to wrestle with some fundamentally new issues having to do with, as I mentioned a moment ago, exploring online sites for information about clients that the clients might consider to be private. You can toss that coin upside down and also ask questions about social workers' privacy because we know for a fact that many clients now search for information about their social workers online. And that raises questions about social workers' own privacy because many of us have an internet presence. In addition, Technology has changed the social work profession with regard to the concept of boundaries. Now, before the introduction of a lot of the omnipresent technology that we're all familiar with, boundaries meant, how do I manage relationships with clients when we live and work in the very same, sometimes small community? How do I manage boundaries related to self-disclosure? How do I manage boundaries when a client invites me to a wedding or a bar mitzvah or a christening? How do I manage boundaries when my agency is considering hiring a former client? Now, these are age-old issues, but now with technology, we have to ask a different set of questions about boundaries, such as having a Facebook relationship with a former client. Now, 
nearly all social workers understand you can't have a personal Facebook relationship with a current client. Although, let me add, I've encountered a couple of practitioners who believe that they enhance the quality of their clinical relationship with a client by maintaining a Facebook relationship with them. I don't endorse that. I think it's very risky. More about that later if you'd like. But what about the boundary issues that emerge when a former client with whom a social worker terminated four or five years ago asks the social worker to be a Facebook friend. Now, this gets a little complicated. And what about texting with a former client? What about the boundaries there? Or having a client follow a social worker's Twitter account? The advent of technology has also introduced new issues related to informed consent, which I can explore in more detail later. Again, social workers have always understood the concept of informed consent before beginning the delivery of services, before releasing confidential information. We've always understood that we need to be sure that clients are competent to provide consent, that they are doing so voluntarily. These are not new issues. But now we're asking new questions about this age-old concept of informed consent because sometimes we are getting clients' consent to receive services remotely online, and we don't know what the client looks like. We are not having face-to-face contact with them, either in person or remotely. Uh, I know of social workers whose entire clinical relationship, and I'll say that again, the entire clinical relationship is limited to text message exchanges. There's no video, there's no telephone contact, and there's no face-to-face meeting. And this raises some really challenging and I dare say controversial questions about what it means to get informed consent under those circumstances. Do clients fully understand the potential benefits and risks? How do we confirm the client's identity when we do not meet with them in person? And then finally, the introduction of technology in social work, particularly clinical social work, has raised some new and, again, challenging questions having to do with how we manage and store very sensitive information. Many social workers who are listening to this webcast might have gotten their training at a time when they recorded their notes with a pen on a pad of paper and put those notes in a manila folder. Many social workers listening to this conversation started their careers when there was no such thing as an electronic health or medical record. Well, now we have to think very carefully about how we manage and store that information, who has access to those records, under what circumstances, how do we protect clients' privacy and confidentiality, and I hope to explore this a little later in our conversation as well. Can you explain how social workers use various forms of technology to access, gather, and manage information about their clients? You mentioned electronic medical record. Sure. So many social workers, as I mentioned a little while ago, in addition to storing information in electronic records and having to make some decisions about who will have access to those records, are also receiving text-based messages from clients. Social workers are sending text-based messages to clients. And for most clinical social workers, we have to be concerned about PHI, protected health information. When many of the folks listening to this conversation started their careers, PHI was the name of a fraternity or a sorority, you know, Alta Delta Phi kind of thing. And now PHI means something very different to us, and that is protected health information. So I know many social workers who have not thought carefully about whether their smartphones they're using to communicate with clients, their smartphones are HIPAA compliant, whether they are using a smartphone app that encrypts and protects this very sensitive information. And I've been involved, as I mentioned earlier, in a couple of licensing board cases where the board was very concerned about the social worker's failure to use HIPAA-compliant encrypted technology to communicate with clients. So we've got issues related to 
managing and storing information in, in an electronic health or medical record. We have concerns about text messages or online social networking, private messaging that social workers and clients are engaging in, the issue with social workers who go online and search for information about clients, often without the client's knowledge or consent. And as I said, clients who are curious about their social workers' lives, which is perfectly understandable, they're no longer simply asking social workers, how old are you? Where do you live? Do you have any children? Are you a person of faith? If so, which one? Because that matters to me. You know, for decades, clients have asked these questions and we've had to manage the boundary issues pertaining to self-disclosure. But now we know that many clients skip past asking those questions and they look online to see what they can find. So we are exchanging information in new ways. Clients are searching for information in new ways. And all of these variations have introduced new and very challenging ethical issues. So what do you think is the biggest problem social workers face when using technology? Well, I would say that there are several problems that I've encountered. On the technical side, and frankly, I think that's the easiest to deal with, I've encountered many well-meaning social workers who want to use technology very responsibly. They understand it does have its benefits. It does enhance many clients' access to services, particularly if they live in remote areas or they are struggling with a disability that makes travel difficult or they're working the day, the day shift and can't come in for an appointment. So they need to interact with a social worker at one in the morning client time and they find a social worker who's available in a a time zone that's three hours earlier uh, that just works for that client's schedule. So there are many benefits. What I'm finding is that some of this technology is so seductive, it is so appealing that social workers are using it without having gotten adequate training in how to use it and how to use it responsibly. I'll give you a quick example. So I've met a number of social workers whose clients move out of state or their clients are traveling, or maybe the social worker is traveling for a couple of months. They want to maintain contact. And the social worker is using Skype to provide video counseling, not knowing two things. One is that Skype, the basic free form of Skype, is not considered HIPAA compliant. So that's a problem. And the social worker may not have been aware that there are video counseling software packages. There's some very good technology out there that is, in fact, HIPAA compliant. They didn't think of that. So they compromised the client's confidentiality. They didn't get the training around that. I, I have met many social workers, more than I can count, who understandably are communicating with their clients using their personal smartphone text messaging software, which is not HIPAA compliant, it's not encrypted. And I will explain to social workers that there are some very good products out there, in my opinion, that do provide text messaging as an option, and it's HIPAA compliant, it's encrypted. And many social workers simply have not gotten the training. I've men, met many social workers who do not have a social media policy, which I can talk about later if you'd like. I mentioned the phrase social media policy, and some of them said, what's that? They haven't gotten the training. In addition to not having gotten adequate training, I am encountering many social workers who simply are not aware of relevant laws. So I mentioned earlier, for example, that a social worker's client may have moved out of state, let's say Louisiana. So the social worker is working in Rhode Island, which is where I am, and worked with the client for several years in Rhode Island. And let's say the client, for family reasons, moved to Louisiana, does not want to start with a new clinician, which I fully understand. And the client and the social worker agree to continue their work together using Skype. Well, problem number one, as I mentioned, is Skype is not considered HIPAA compliant. And number two, the social worker may not be aware that Louisiana, like many states, has passed a law that says that if a social worker is providing clinical services remotely, in other words, the social worker is not in Louisiana, is living in another state, 
and is providing an electronic service using video, telephone, text, private instant messaging, whatever, to a resident of Louisiana, that social worker must be licensed in Louisiana. Now, that social worker may have never visited Louisiana, doesn't plan to live there. Well, according to the law, that social worker needs to be licensed in Louisiana. So in answer to your question, one of the big problems social workers face is not keeping up with the laws, which are changing pretty rapidly, regarding statutes and regulations that govern the delivery of services using technology. So that's one issue. Another issue is social workers who are not aware that the National Association of Social Workers Code of Ethics changed fundamentally, and I highlight that word fundamentally, as of January 1st, 2018. Now, as you mentioned in your introduction, I was honored and privileged to chair the task force that wrote the Code of Ethics in the 1990s, which is the foundation of the current code. A couple of years ago, several colleagues and I were asked by NASW to revisit the code. And the sole purpose of that effort was to consider the ways in which technology has introduced new ethical issues that we were not aware of. They didn't cross our minds in the 1990s when the group that I chair drafted the code. And so a couple of years ago, several colleagues and I, Alan Barsky and several others, spent quite a bit of time looking at the code. We didn't eliminate much of anything. We added a a number of very, very compelling new standards related to technology. Well, to this day, I'm encountering social workers who aren't aware that the Code of Ethics was revised dramatically as of January 1st, 2018. And on a more practical note, in addition to the guidance that the new standards in the Code of Ethics provide, many social workers I find are not aware that their own state law, their own state licensing regulations have adopted that Code of Ethics. Now, not every state does word for word, but many states do. And the point here is that when our Code of Ethics changes, the NASW Code of Ethics, that means that for many social workers, their state law just changed. And with regard to technology, social workers must know what those changes are that are now embedded in the current Code of Ethics. They need to know how their state has adopted those standards because social workers are going to be held to those standards. So, for example, if a social worker is not using state-of-the-art encrypted technology that protects clients, that's not only a violation of the Code of Ethics, but it could also be violating their state law, which exposes social workers to some risk. So you mentioned the social media policy. How can social workers protect their clients' confidentiality when using technology? So with specific regard to the social media policy, let me explain very briefly what I mean by that term. There are two types of social media policies in my experience. Number one, for social workers who are employed by an agency, and as we know, many social workers are not in private or independent practice. Many are, but many are not. Many of them work for mental health centers, family service agencies, schools, hospitals, psychiatric clinics, and so forth. And the first type of social media policy is typically developed by the employer And it governs the ways in which social workers are and are not permitted to use social media in their day-to-day work. So in other words, it'll be the four or five page document that says, as an employee of this mental health center, you may not have a a social networking relationship such as Facebook with your client or your patient. You are not permitted to use your personal smartphone device to communicate with clients or patients, that sort of thing. Here are the websites you're allowed to visit or not visit as an employee. All right. So that's one type of social media policy. But the second type, which I think is even more important for social workers to know about, especially people in private practice or independent practice, is a 
relatively short, simple document, one page, one and a half pages, user-friendly language that explains to clients very clearly how the social worker conducts herself or himself with regard to technology. So in very simple, straightforward language, the social worker informs the client in writing and perhaps also verbally that the social worker cannot be a Facebook friend. And the reason is the issue you brought up when you asked me this question. The social worker is basically saying, I want to protect your confidentiality. I want to protect your privacy. It's not appropriate for us to be communicating on an online social networking site such as Facebook. But in addition, there are boundary issues. And this is an opportunity to speak with the client, to inform the client about the importance of clear professional boundaries. And being a Facebook friend, of course, can compromise that. A good social media policy also has on it clear instructions to the client about how to contact the social worker uh, outside the office, if they even have an office relationship. So, for example, a social media policy might say something like, and I'm paraphrasing, if you're having a crisis, please contact me by telephone between the hours of this and that. If you're having an emergency outside of those hours, please go to your local emergency department, that sort of thing. But it also informs clients that texting uh, may not be private that the social worker may not be able to protect the client's confidential information because some clients will send a text message, not simply to change an appointment or to say I'm running five minutes late, which is understandable, but some clients are sending social workers text messages with bona fide clinical content, including sometimes crisis-related information. Well, you know, crises happen 24-7. So a social worker may have a client who sends the crisis text message at 1.30 in the morning, you know, about the teenage daughter who didn't come home tonight, and I'm freaking out, and I don't know what to do, and the social worker uh, doesn't check the message until late the following morning and didn't respond to the crisis. So the client who's engaging in suicidal ideation, who sends a text message, with information about that. So the social media policy would spell out how the client ought to contact the social worker, particularly if there's a crisis. A good social media policy will say the same sort of thing about email communications. And importantly, I think a good social media policy also explains to the client that to protect the client's privacy, the social worker as a matter of routine, will not search online for information about the client without the client's knowledge or consent. It's sending a message to a client that communicates to the client that the social worker respects the client's privacy, so much so that it's right there on on paper that the social worker won't conduct these online searches, Google or Facebook or LinkedIn, let's say, without the client's knowledge or consent. And typically, I would say the social media policy does say that there may be some legitimate exceptions. In other words, if there's an emergency, the client has disappeared, the social worker has a compelling reason to search for information, and then the social media policy will typically say, and if I do conduct that search, I want you to know that I will tell you that I did it. In other words, I will be transparent. I'll document that I did it, assuming we see each other again. So it's a very straightforward and, in my opinion, ethical way to handle that. And and these are key elements of a social media policy that I think agencies ought to have, typical private or independent practice social workers ought to have. So that's that. You mentioned informed consent. Can you explain informed consent and how it can be complicated by the use of technology? And informed consent isn't just somebody signing a document or clicking on an electronic medical record that they consent. Isn't it something that you do with your clients and throughout the relationship? Of course. And and as I mentioned earlier, informed consent is hardly a new concept. It's been around for, you know, about a century in social work. However, as I also mentioned, we now have to think very differently about informed consent when it comes to 
social workers and clients' use of technology. So, you know, key elements, as I mentioned earlier, the client must be competent to consent. And it's not just mental capacity or cognitive capacity. It's also age. Well, this gets a little tricky. So suppose a social worker has an online clinical practice, as some do, full-time or part-time, and they get a query from a potential client who lives 724 miles away. They're never going to meet in person. And the client, the potential client says, I'm interested in getting counseling. I have some anxiety issues. I understand you specialize in this. My name is John Smith, age 24. Well, number one, how does the social worker know that it's John Smith? It's not Sam Jones. And how does the social worker know that this person is of age and can consent that the person is not 17 years old. So with regard to capacity to to consent, both cognitive capacity and capacity is defined by law by virtue of age, social workers have to be very, very careful. And of course, it has to be voluntary. And that requires some assessment uh, as well. But there are other novel challenges that social workers typically haven't had to think about before the advent of this technology. So, for example, if a client wanted a brother, a sister, a mother, a friend, a partner to participate in a counseling session, a a social worker who provided traditional face-to-face counseling would obviously know that there's somebody else in the room. Well, I've encountered several situations where the client, for reasons known perhaps only to the client, wanted someone else to sit in a video counseling session, but did not want the social worker to know that. It's video counseling, and the person who was sitting in on the session was behind, physically behind, the client's camera. In other words, the social worker had no idea that there was somebody else in the room. So uh, social workers who are, are aware of these potential issues and potential risks will include in their informed consent protocol some guidelines that they never had to include before this technology was available. And that is that the client is consenting to remote counseling using this technology, that the client agrees that there are potential benefits, there are potential risks, which the social worker presumably has explained, that the client agrees as part of the informed consent process that the session will include only the client, no third parties, unless the client has arranged for a third party to be present with the social worker during that remote session. It's just a a different way of thinking about informed consent. Social workers now who provide services to clients they never meet in person, I think have to build in as part of the consent protocol, verification of the client's identity, where the client may scan and send, for example, a copy of a driver's license, which doesn't guarantee that the client isn't using someone else's license. I think it's highly unlikely, but at least the social worker makes a good faith effort to dot those I's and cross those T's. And also, as as part of the informed consent process related to social workers' use of technology, social workers have to build in very specific information, I think, about potential risks. They range from clinical emergencies, clinical crises. For example, the client who's engaged in active suicidal ideation but lives 724 miles away, they've never met in person, and the social worker has to do her or his best to arrange emergency services in this community that the social worker is not familiar with at all. Well, that's a risk. And also the risk of technological failure. So I imagine that all of us have had the experience in recent years where we're in the middle of a video session and the computer freezes or there's a power failure or the software is buffering and you can't communicate. I've certainly had that experience. I do a lot of lecturing remotely around the world. I was recently lecturing to an audience in Indonesia and there were some technical challenges during the presentation. Now, fortunately, it wasn't a clinical crisis, so I didn't have to worry about that. 
But you know, I've been around long enough to know that technology is not perfect. And you can imagine situations where a client is in this intense exchange with a social worker. There's this sort of breakthrough moment. The tears are coming down the client's cheeks, major epiphanies, and then there's a technology failure. And so, you know, that can interrupt that clinical exchange, obviously. It can jeopardize the quality of the social worker's effectiveness. And clients need to understand that this is part of the package when you're using technology. Do social workers need to comply with state laws or federal laws? They need to abide by or comply with both. So let me spell that out briefly. First of all, let me remind all of your listeners, that the newest version of the Code of Ethics, again, effective January 1st, 2018, discusses this very issue about complying with the laws of both the jurisdiction in which the social worker practices and the jurisdiction, not or, and the jurisdiction where the client is located. And that could be another state. It could be another country. So social workers are permitted to use technology to provide services to clients who live in other jurisdictions. However, here's the caveat. It is up to social workers to check into the laws of the state where the social worker is licensed and the laws of the jurisdictions where the client is residing during the delivery of services. And as I mentioned a while ago, those laws vary state to state. There is no one-stop shopping. We do not have a national law on telebehavioral health. There are some efforts in the works to enhance what we call portability and mobility, but there is no one single law. So every social worker who's considering delivering a service remotely to clients in another jurisdiction, I believe, needs to check out the law in both the social worker's jurisdiction and the clients. Now, many countries don't have any laws. So, for example, I know of situations where a social worker's client has moved to France or is going to be spending a year abroad in Switzerland. And there may not be any laws in that country, but we still have a responsibility to check it out. Now, you asked about federal laws as well. Social workers need to comply with both state and relevant federal laws. On the federal side, there's HIPAA. Everybody's familiar with HIPAA, right? Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Well, there are provisions in HIPAA and there are provisions in what's called HITECH. H-I-T-E-C-H is the uh, abbreviation. It's the Health Information for Economic and Clinical Health Act. I'll say that again. That's a mouthful. Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act, better known as HITECH. That's a federal law, along with HIPAA, that spells out obligations for health and behavioral health practitioners who are using technology. You know, you're supposed to conduct a privacy audit, for example, to ensure proper encryption and that sort of thing. So there's HIPAA, there's HITECH. If social workers are using technology, to diagnose, treat, or refer for treatment for substance use disorders. Let me say that again. If social workers are using technology to diagnose, treat, and refer for treatment for substance use disorders and, not or, and those social workers work in a program that meets two criteria, they receive federal money for something, anything, and the social worker works in a program that is explicitly focused on substance use disorders. It could be a substance use disorder program, an agency, or it could be part of a larger agency. In other words, it could be the substance use disorder program embedded within a larger hospital. Those social workers are required to comply with what's called Title 42, Code of Federal Regulations Part 2, otherwise known as 42 CFR Part 2, and we often call these Part 2 programs. I encounter social workers who do not know that this law exists. They fall under it but aren't aware of it, 
And they need to know that the way they use technology to diagnose, treat, or refer for treatment clients who are struggling with substance use disorders and the social workers work in settings that meet those two criteria that I mentioned, they have to comply with this very strict law. And it is much, much, much stricter than HIPAA. Social workers who work in school settings. So we know many social workers work in schools as a school social worker. It could be a public school. It could be a a residential school that receives some federal money for special needs. Those social workers typically would be held not to HIPAA, not to HIPAA typically, but to what's called FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Title 34, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 99. And in short, social workers have to understand how they can and cannot protect their student clients' confidential information because of the guidelines in FERPA as opposed to HIPAA. So this is really complicated. And a lot of these laws apply to non-technology issues, but they also apply to the way we manage, store, and communicate information electronically. Are there other potential risks social workers face when using technology? I think there are a couple that I have not mentioned, particularly clinical social workers who are providing services to clients remotely. So most of us understand that there are a number of companies out there that have recruited and hired social workers to provide therapeutic services to clients that the social workers will never meet in person. Well, just yesterday, and I mean literally yesterday, I got a call from a clinical social worker working for one of these companies who's dealing with a client she's never met in person, and the social worker is panicking because after several online exchanges, the client, as I was told, is manifesting symptoms of suicidal ideation, and the social worker doesn't feel prepared to handle them remotely for obvious reasons. And so the social worker contacted me to think through how to protect the client, of course, the top priority, but also how to minimize risk to to the social worker who doesn't want to be sued for having failed to manage a suicide risk properly, doesn't want to be on the receiving end of a licensing board complaint. And this is the kind of work that I typically do, this kind of consultation. And and I had to talk to the social worker in detail about the steps I would take to, to minimize risk to the client, first and foremost, and to the social worker herself. And so one of the risks, back to your question, is How do you manage situations where there's a crisis and you don't have a personal face-to-face relationship with a client? And there are these situations, obviously, where clients in social workers' judgment needs a higher level of care. And social workers have to anticipate this possibility. I think they need to have protocols in place in the event they're not able to meet clients' needs and it's an emergency situation. Here's another potential risk. I know of situations several, when social workers who are providing services remotely concluded that a client has allegedly abused or neglected a child, an older adult, or a person with a disability. Now, we all know about state laws, mandated reporting, right? So these are laws we've all learned about that require social workers who suspect abuse or neglect of a child, older adult, person with a disability, depending on the state you're in, and that state's law, to notify protective services within X number of hours, whatever that is. And and that's usually specified in law. Well, what do you do if the only way you know your client is through the client's username on a text messaging app And the client's username may be, you know, TwinkleToes32. And then that's all you know. And how how do you comply with a mandatory reporting law when you don't have the identifying information? So in my opinion, anybody who engages in this kind of remote delivery of clinical services needs to anticipate that possibility. Of course, it's not likely, but we all know that we can't forecast when we will learn that a client poses a threat to a child, an older adult, a person with disability, or some other party 
you know, the client who's threatening to go shoot somebody and, and communicates that to the social worker electronically. I know that may seem highly unlikely, but this happens. And social workers need to have protocols that anticipate that possibility so that social workers can prevent harm, number one, and also comply with uh, state law regarding mandated reporting, uh, disclosures to protect third parties from harm, so-called duty to protect, duty to warn laws, and that sort of thing. When a client enters into a clinical relationship with a social worker, is that just one hour a week or is the social worker responsible for that client for the rest of the hours of the day or the rest of the days of the week? So that's a great question and, and difficult to answer. The reason it's difficult is there is no explicit ethical standard, no explicit law that spells out how available the social worker must be. Now, you know, in traditional face-to-face relationships, you know, many clients will come in once a week, once every two weeks, once a month, if there's no compelling issue, what have you. And all of that is considered reasonable, right? You're not expected as a social worker to be available 24-7, 365. You are expected to give clients information about what they ought to do if there's a crisis and you're not available. But what about when the relationship is remote. It's electronic. Video, email, text messaging, smartphone app, what have you. Here too, there are no explicit statutes, regulations, code of ethics standards. What this boils down to, in my opinion, is how we define a critically important concept that ethicists and lawyers call the standard of care. What's the standard of care? The standard of care, which in the United States has been the measuring rod for questions such as this. In other words, what what are you expected to do in every profession, whether it's architecture, engineering, medicine, dentistry, or social work? The measuring rod since the late 1800s has been this concept of standard of care, which was introduced in the United States in the context of a very famous court case called Coombs versus Bede which originated in the state of Maine and then reached the Supreme Court. And in a nutshell, what the court held is that whenever questions surface with regard to what a professional, no matter what the profession, ought to have done. So in, in so for our conversation today, how available should a social worker be? when the entire relationship is electronic or remote? How many hours a day? How many days of the week? When does the workday end? These are new questions. It's standard of care. Standard of care is typically defined as what a reasonable and prudent professional, what a reasonable and prudent professional with the same or similar training should have done. So what does that mean? Well, There's no law you can look to that says you must be available three hours a day between the hours of uh, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. There's no such law. The question is standard of care. If a social worker is providing clinical services remotely to a client to supplement face-to-face or instead of face-to-face encounters, what would a reasonable and prudent social worker do with regard to availability, with regard to social media policies, with regard to informed consent protocols. In my opinion, it boils down to that. So worst case scenario, and by the way, I have been an expert witness, that's the court's term, I've been an expert witness in the kind of case I'm about to describe, where a social worker provides clinical services to a client, the client commits suicide or attempts to commit suicide, the social worker is sued by the client if he or she is alive or surviving family members, a lawsuit that alleges a failure to monitor the client's status, provide adequate assessment, adequate follow-up services. I've been involved in many of those lawsuits and licensing board complaints, same case. Now, if the relationship was entirely remote The plaintiffs, the parties bringing the lawsuit or the complainant in a licensing board case, would allege typically 
that the social worker was either negligent in the management of this remote clinical relationship, if it's a lawsuit, negligent, or failed to abide by licensing standards in terms of the management of that remote relationship. Usually, it boils down to an assessment of the standard of care that was in effect at the time of the attempted suicide. Let me say that again. The standard of care that was in effect at the time this crisis occurred. So typically, lawyers and licensing boards, and I've, I've been brought into these cases by both many, many times, they will always ask me the question, what was the standard of care at the time this event occurred? And I have to use my professional opinion with regard to what I think a reasonable and prudent practitioner should have done in that instance. And that assessment is not based simply on what I think. That's not what a standard of care is. It's what's reflected in practice standards in social work, code of ethics standards in social work, the emerging literature on ethics and risk management related to technology in social work. So standard of care is established by literature, by code of ethics standards, by practice standards. And unlike even a handful of years ago, all of that now exists in social work. And those are the elements of the standard of care that would be used as the measuring rod if anyone raises questions about a social worker's protocols and judgment in the form of a lawsuit or licensing board complaint. This is the world I now live in. Are there potential risks clients face when using technology, such as tracking devices on their smartphones? Well, there is some technology that's probably on many of your listeners' phone without their knowledge of it. And there are other apps that people can download onto their phone. So, for example, many people use Google Maps to find their way to the party or to a meeting or what have you. We all do that. Or one of the other you know, options. There's a way for people to make available to others in their network information about where they are at any given moment. That's called geolocation. So that may be embedded in the whatever mobile phone app you're using to navigate uh, directions, again, which almost all of us do. I'm not sure my adult daughters know how to read a map because they came of age at a time when they didn't have to look at a map. On the other hand, other individuals, including some social workers, but especially clients, are downloading apps on their phone and then using that to share with people in their network. So it's kind of like a Facebook network. It's like any of these where you choose who's in your network. There's one called Find My Friends. There was one that was very popular for some time called Foursquare. There are others where you are basically agreeing to let your friends, colleagues, and acquaintances in your electronic network know where you are. So if you go to, if a client, let's say, goes to a restaurant, the friends know they're at this Mexican restaurant on 4th Street. And the and the client who doesn't mind letting people know that they're at this Mexican restaurant on 4th Street, the client may write a little review, like, you got to check out this new place. It's terrific. The burritos are to die for. And that's, people do this stuff now. Well, Some clients are not aware of or are not thinking about the fact that if they go to their therapist's office, if they actually have a face-to-face appointment, that is, that they're telling the world where they are. And somebody can just Google that address and see that it's a, a therapist's office. Sometimes there's a sign on the front door that may show up in the little photo that pops up. So in terms of boundaries and privacy, it's important that clients know that if they have what we call a GPS-enabled smartphone, a GPS, Global Positioning System smartphone, they may be telling the world, or at least people in their network, when they are visiting their therapist. Now, there's nothing wrong with that if that's what people want to do, but some clients aren't even aware of the risk. And so that is another potential risk. So why is it important to seek supervision when dealing with complicated internet-related ethical dilemmas? 
why is it important for social workers to get supervision for anything is my sort of <laughs> my glib answer. I, but I want to distinguish here between supervision and consultation. So supervision to me is vertical. In other words, if a social worker works in a mental health agency, a psychiatric clinic, the supervisor is the person who is above them, so to speak. It's vertical. And supervisees are expected to comply with the instructions of a supervisor. There's an accountability there. However, many of your listeners may be in private or independent practice. They don't have supervisors. They have peers. So they are in what I would call a peer consultation group. That's horizontal. There's no expectation of accountability there. The colleagues don't control the social workers' clinical activities. So I think in private practice, Consultation is vitally important. And that's been around forever, of course. When, you know, private practitioners and others are in peer consultation groups, they they confer with each other about difficult cases. I would simply extend that concept. It's nothing new that, that particularly when social workers are using technology with which they're not familiar, they're beginning to learn how to use it. They're learning how to use it responsibly and ethically. It's Really important, I think, to have peer consultants to help them learn or to consult about difficult challenges, a number of which we've discussed. Same thing with supervision. If a social worker is working in a setting where they're using technology to deliver services, to manage and store information, they are using it to perhaps to look up information about clients without clients' knowledge or consent. In my opinion, they ought to be talking about these issues with their supervisors to be sure they're doing it responsibly. I think it's not only good practice, it's good risk management, because in the event that anyone raises questions about the social worker's use of technology, if they're not consulting with colleagues, if they're not bringing it up in supervision, that could provide evidence that the social worker is not practicing uh, ethically. And I should add, by the way, the irony of all this, that some social workers are using technology, but don't have anybody in their local communities. They may live in a rural area or an area where they don't have colleagues who know a whole lot about this technology. So there are online peer consultation groups. You can join an online network peer consultation. So you may have a social worker who lives in New Jersey who's part of a group where the other social workers live in Tallahassee, Florida, Denver, Colorado, Boise, Idaho, and Spokane, Washington. And they've never met, but they're an online peer consultation group. So there's a lot out there. And so both consultation and supervision, I think, are vitally important with this novel use of technology. What do you do if your supervisor doesn't know a lot about technology? So I would answer the question the same way I would answer this question. Forget the technology. Suppose a clinical social worker is struggling with a complex clinical case involving a client who has both a serious eating disorder and substance use disorder. And the supervisor knows a lot about substance use disorders, but doesn't know a lot about eating disorders. It seems to me any responsible social worker and responsible supervisor would say, let's get some additional consultation here around the eating disorder, particularly when it intersects with a substance use disorder. In other words, I would say in any instance, when a supervisor doesn't have the knowledge or expertise on a particular topic, whether it's an eating disorder or given today's conversation, technology, then you have to look beyond the supervision in one's own site and find it elsewhere, either somewhere else in one's agency or outside the agency. To me, that's not only good practice, it's good risk management. And if one doesn't do that, if the supervisor isn't familiar with all of the issues that we've discussed today, uh, to me, a responsible supervisor would say, let's go find somebody who knows this stuff and bring that person in. That makes a lot of sense. Can you share how technology used correctly has the potential to positively impact social work practice for clients and society as a whole? Sure. So I've raised a number of potential problems, potential risks, both clinical and ethical and legal as well uh, with regard to, to use of technology. But I want to make it clear. I think there are many, many benefits, potential benefits. We have to be 
cognizant of both the risks and the benefits. So I know that there are many people who live in remote areas. They cannot get to a clinical social worker or another behavioral health professional easily. They don't have to, they would have to drive 72 miles past many cows and farms and silos and it's just not convenient. So the technology enhances access. I know of many people with severe disabilities. They may not live that far from a clinical site, but they are a double amputee or they have a major anxiety disorder or they struggle with vision. And for them to get in a vehicle and travel even four miles is a challenge. And so using technology to provide them with services is, I think, terrific. As I mentioned a while ago, there are people who need help in life whose work schedules, they're working two jobs to try to pay the rent. They just don't lend themselves those work schedules to coming into somebody's office. They want help at two in the morning. They can use technology to find someone who's available. It may not be two in the morning where the clinician is, but there's somebody in the world somewhere who's available online. And I think that's very helpful for someone who's in crisis or has a serious chronic issue. There's also cost. Sadly, many people have insurance policies that don't provide generous behavioral health benefits, or they exhaust their benefits, or they have no insurance because they lost their job or they're between jobs. And so many of the remote online options available for counseling, behavioral health services, frankly, are cheaper than in-office services. Think about it. There, are, there may be like little or no overhead. You may have a clinician who's doing this from his or her den in their home. They're not paying rent on an office. They don't have to insure an office. So they have lower overhead and they can charge less. So often, not always, the remotely available services are simply cheaper. And if somebody's paying out of pocket, that's helpful. In addition, I've met some people, not many, but some, who find it very challenging, unsettling to sit in a social worker's office. There's something about being face-to-face with somebody, talking about one's interior intimate life that's very challenging. And there are some people who prefer the emotional distance that technology provides. They, they may be more candid. They may be more forthcoming. They may be more forthright because they feel more comfortable talking to a, a microphone or a, a camera than they feel when they're sitting with somebody face to face. Again, I don't think that's widespread, but I do think that is the case for some. So there are lots of potential benefits. We have to be mindful of those as well as the potential risks. So as a social worker myself, we spend a lot of time getting our license and we want to keep our license and preserve our license over the years. Is that correct? Absolutely. And on that score, let me add one other recommendation. I know that private practitioners typically have their own malpractice insurance. There are two key mistakes that too many social workers make. Number one, they don't check their coverage to be sure that they have adequate coverage for technology-related problems. So now, social workers can get access to, in addition to their standard uh, malpractice policy, they can get coverage for any HIPAA-related problem. They can get what's called cyber liability coverage, C-Y-B-E-R, cyber liability coverage, in case their software is hacked, there's an encryption problem, any problem. They, they have information on their laptop that was in the trunk of their car while they were on vacation and the car was stolen. Get cyber liability coverage if you're using technology. And for social workers who are using technology as employees, in other words, they're not in private practice, they work in a mental health center, a hospital, what have you, my strong, strong, strong recommendation is Do not rely entirely on your employer's malpractice policy. Get your own. It's relatively inexpensive, particularly when the insurance company knows that your primary employer, 
has a policy. That brings down the cost of your own because it's second in line. But I've encountered too many situations where social workers who use technology were named in a lawsuit or named in a licensing board complaint or both. And the employer's policy did not cover the legal defense because there was a conflict of interest where allegedly the social worker didn't comply with the employer's policies or the judgment or settlement exceeded the cap on the employer's policy, the say million dollar coverage in a suicide case. It doesn't happen often, but it's happened. And also there are many employers whose malpractice or negligence policy does not include coverage for legal defense in a licensing board case. A lot of social workers I find are not aware of that. And so while some employers may cover the legal fees associated with a licensing board complaint, if there's an allegation of a technology-related breach, many policies that employers have do not provide that coverage because it's it, they don't cover the social worker's individual license. The only way to get that coverage in some instances is for the social worker to have her or his own policy, which typically provides legal defense in a licensing board matter, as well as in the event of a lawsuit. The likelihood of those happening is relatively small. I don't want to stir up anxiety, but I've been involved in too many cases where social workers did not have their own policy and they paid dearly for that mistake. Why is it important to document when these issues happen? For example, if you do by some chance breach confidentiality, let's say, why is it important to document that you did breach the confidentiality? Let's say you sent an email to the wrong person. Isn't it important to just document and let the client know that you did that? Well, yes. The simple answer is yes. And one reason to do it is because as of January 1st, 2018, the Code of Ethics requires that documentation. Again, that's why social workers need to read the current code. So if one doesn't document it, that's a breach of the current code. More broadly, what I have learned in my career over many years is that if the client or former client raises questions, or it could be a third party, you know, the client's relative who files the complaint. I've had many of those cases as well. If anyone, the client, a client's partner, another party, raises questions about the social worker's management of electronic information, use of technology, the defense that the social worker is able to put forward depends so heavily on the quality of documentation. I cannot emphasize this enough. So the Code of Ethics requires it, but from a risk management perspective, a social worker's ability to defend a lawsuit or a licensing board complaint, or both, depends so heavily on the quality of the documentation. And I'm not exaggerating. This is not hyperbole. When I say that the outcome of the cases in which I serve as an expert witness, the outcome of those cases, more often than not, is based on the quality of the documentation, almost more than anything else. And that includes documenting what you mentioned, if there's an unfortunate HIPAA breach, let's say, how did it happen? How did the social worker handle it? How did the social worker inform the client about the breach? That's got to be documented. Also, the other issues we've discussed, if the social worker is concerned about a client, the social worker is treating remotely, the client who's in the middle of the crisis, I told you just yesterday, I got that call. I said to the person who called me yesterday, when we hang up the phone, please document that you called me. Please document what we talked about. Please document the steps you have taken and will take to protect this client, to minimize risk. And in the event there's a complaint filed against you, let's say, heaven forbid, the client commits suicide or attempts to commit suicide. You want a paper trail, or as we would say today, you want a digital trail, because it's often not paper, that spells out explicitly the steps you took, the responsible steps you took. You looked 
at the code of ethics standards. You looked at the new practice standards that I mentioned. You looked at whatever relevant laws there are. You called so-and-so for consultation. You want to document all of that because that's the standard of care. I agree. So how can my audience learn more about your work, either online or in print? So I've written a lot on these issues. Some of my books on uh, risk management in social work. I have a book on boundary issues in dual relationships. I have a book on social work values and ethics. All of these books, the current editions include quite a bit of content on the ethical and risk management issues associated with social workers' use of technology. Lots of journal articles and book chapters. People can just do the online search and try to get hold of those. If they're not available uh, online, they can go through a library to access the articles and book chapters I've written on these issues. And I would also strongly encourage your listeners to, number one, read the current NASW Code of Ethics because... It includes a lot of new details regarding the ethical use of technology. That's number one. Number two, I strongly encourage your listeners to review the new technology in social work practice standards. I'll say that again. Technology in social work practice standards that were recently adopted by the four prominent national organizations in social work, NASW, the Association of Social Work Boards, the Council on Social Work Education, and the Clinical Social Work Association. These went into effect just a couple of years ago, and this is now part of the standard of care. They can simply do an online search for those standards. They're on NASW's website. They can just Google what I just said. It is a 60-page document that outlines the current standard of care. And I want to emphasize that phrase again. These are the standards of care we are now held to. The courts recognize these standards. Licensing boards recognize these standards. And the third thing I would suggest is that social workers, as I mentioned earlier, check out the laws in your state, which change, keep up with them, and check out the laws in any jurisdiction in which your clients or potential clients are located to be sure that you are complying with current laws. And that includes both statutes and regulations. And there will be links to all of this in the show notes. So Dr. Reamer, on behalf of myself, my listeners, and all of the people that you've helped through your work, I want to thank you for your contributions to mental health treatment and for taking the time out of your busy schedule to help me and my audience better understand the field of technology and social work practice. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So be sure to check out my website, therapyshow.com, which has many resources about mental health. And there you will find how to submit questions, stories, or insights that you have about the mental health system or suggestions about who else I can interview and how I can improve the show. And I'd like to close by reminding our listeners to please subscribe, share, and review this podcast so that you, someone you love, and people around the world can gain more benefit from therapy. There's no need to suffer in silence. Get the help that you need to create the life that you want. 